The year was 1984. McDonald's released the McDLT, while Wendy's asked, Where's the beef? Van Halen released one of their most popular albums named after that same year. Ghostbusters had us all calling for help, and The Terminator kept us coming back for more. The Cosby Show and Miami Vice debuted and quickly became TV staples, while Transformers toys sparked the imagination of children everywhere. And let's not forget Apple's iconic 1984 Macintosh commercial during the Super Bowl. On January 24th, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh. And you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. But for IBM compatible lovers of all ages, this year holds special significance as it marked the release of one of the most beloved personal computers of the 80s and into the 90s, the Tandy 1000 from Radio Shack. The Tandy 1000 wasn't just another computer, it was a gateway to the digital world of multi-channel PC sound and 16 color graphics. Let's dive into the history of the Tandy 1000 and explore its impact on the home computer revolution. It's coming up right now on the Retro Hack Shack. Radio Shack, once a beloved store and strip mall mecca for all things electronic, went through bankruptcy in 2017, resulting in the shuttering of most of its retail locations in the United States. However, in the late 70s and early 80s, it was the place to go to buy a personal computer. After releasing the successful TRS-80 in 1977 and the color computer in 1980, the Tandy Corporation, parent company of Radio Shack, was looking for the next big thing in personal computing that they could put on their shelves. Mark Siegel, product manager and engineer at Tandy Radio Shack, was working on, well, seemingly every computer for Radio Shack at the time. My, my, my role turned out to be, it was very weird. It was whatever I wished it to be, I could go do in the company. They, they put no bounds on me whatsoever. I moved over to Radio Shack to start Radio Shack Engineering, and I was the manager of, well, the, my title, I guess, was product manager of all home products the home computer products. Mark was deeply involved in many of the product decisions that Tandy made during that time, and so we'll be hearing some first-hand accounts from Mark throughout the video. During this period of time, Tandy took notice of the rise of the IBM PC clones on the market, and so did Mark. One of the first things I did when I came to Tandy was I went out and bought an IBM PC for myself because I'm, I'm just the kind that likes to explore stuff. And it quickly allowed me to become sort of the most knowledgeable PC person in the company. Tandy Radio Shack's first two attempts at a PC clone were not great successes. They released the Tandy TRS-80-2000 in September 1983, and later the unsuccessful Tandy 1200. The 2000 wasn't fully compatible with the PC and ended up being a flop. Why? probably because of cost. It was designed as a business Windows machine and Radio Shack had an interesting problem. It really wanted to be a business computer company, but it spent 80% on business computers and returned 20% profits we're in the home computer market. We spent 20% on home computer products and got 80% of our profit off of that. So that was always something that, well, you know, the home market drove it even though they did everything in their power to want to be a business computer product and compete with IBM. But that was just not to be. Meanwhile, IBM was also looking for a successor to the IBM PC that they had released in 1981. Compared to IBM's more expensive products, this relatively inexpensive computer, made with off-the-shelf components and an operating system from Microsoft, was flying off the shelves in the business market like Cabbage Patch dolls at a Black Friday sale. 
However, they wanted their next computer line to be more family friendly, to compete with the likes of the Apple IIe and the Commodore 64 that were cheaper and had better support for games with color and sound. So in March 1984, IBM released the PC Junior, a less expensive PC targeting the home market that had a built-in floppy drive and cartridge slots too. However, the system was hurt by incompatibility issues, a crappy chiclet keyboard, a small amount of memory, and a proprietary sidecar expansion slot system. I'll be covering more detail about the PC Junior in an upcoming history video, but suffice it to say, the computer did horribly for IBM, and it was discontinued just a year later. IBM came out with their Junior, and we looked at that and said, all right, that's, that's a home computer. Unfortunately, they did some really stupid stuff on it, so we looked at it and said, yeah, we can do that except do it the right way, and, and, and we did. Tandy realized that the basic architecture of the PC Junior was still based on off-the-shelf components, like the sound and video chips, which came from Texas Instruments and Motorola. I think I probably would have made some different decisions on the PC Junior, but at the point, at that point, we just went in and most of the PC Junior stuff was off the shelf circuitry. So the, the original 1000 was an easy product to design. I'll come back to the huge impact that reusing the sound and video chips had on the software market in just a few minutes. But first, let's talk about getting ready for the release of the first Tandy 1000. When the first prototypes came out, it wasn't all Care Bears and Rainbow Bright over at Tandy Radio Shack. They had to figure out how to connect things like their existing Radio Shack joysticks, and they had to come up with a BIOS that wouldn't violate IBM copyright. We had joysticks that worked on color computers that were potentiometers, where IBM had done their joystick with rheostats. So we basically didn't want to have two joysticks so we basically had to come up with a scheme to get a potentiometer to work with a rheostat driven joystick. And, and there's some other little things here and there. I did just want to ask about the, the BIOS. Uh, that was simple. Phoenix BIOS just came on the market and we made a deal to basically give them a big chunk of money and we would own the source code. Oh, nice. Uh, so we never had to pay Phoenix again, and we had a and we had a source code for IBM BIOS that was free and clear that we could just go modify and add stuff to. The first Tandy 1000 was released in November 1984 for $1,200 before discounts. That's 3,600 in today's money, just in time for Christmas. Radio Shack knows when you're in business for yourself, you have to be productive to be profitable. The Tandy 1000 gives you a wide choice of PC-compatible software that allows your small business to do the job efficiently. And the price performance of the Tandy 1000 will convince you to have one for work or study at home. Tandy Computers. In business. For business. Only at Radio Shack. The Tandy 1000 sold more units in the first month than any other Tandy product, and by early 1985, it was the best-selling computer on the market. The reviews were not just good, they were great. And considering most reviewers were rather skeptical at this point, we're talking on fire, like Michael Jackson's hair in a Pepsi commercial. In an article subtitled, Junior Meets His Match, John J. Anderson of Creative Computing called the original Tandy 1000 the machine IBM was too inept, incapable, or afraid to manufacture. It's sure to put a whopping dent not only in PC Junior sales, but into sales of the PC Senior as well. In the article, he goes on to mention its low price, good PC software compatibility, and the network of Radio Shack stores as selling points. InfoWorld noted that the Tandy 1000 was fully one-third less than a comparable equipped IBM PC and predicted that the computer was really intended for the elusive home computer market and speculated that in retrospect it may have been the PC Junior's final straw. It called the 1000 almost as fully IBM PC compatible as a computer can get. 
Byte Magazine called the Tandy 1000 a good, reasonably priced IBM PC clone that has most of the best features of the IBM PC and PC Junior. At current prices, it is a very good alternative. Was there any issues when that was brought to market? No, we sold them like hotcakes. I, I remember a party we had after we hit the one millionth, 1,000. There was a big, huge cake on the 19th floor. So yeah, we were selling 1,000s like mad. There was a point at which one, one of the funny things was, you know, after you manufacture a, a circuit board, you need to clean it off. And for the most part, People were using these horrific cleaning machines. Mm. And, and so the guy that was in charge of production went and bought a, a whole bunch of dishwashers. So he would take the boards and basically put them in the dishwasher to clean them off. And, and then had special dryers to make sure that we didn't get any rust from it. So that, that was always humorous to me. One big difference in the Tandy 1000 and IBM models was the cost. Luckily, Tandy Radio Shack had a huge advantage here. Especially since IBM came up with this Fakakta method of adding modules onto the side and having stuff go through the bus instead of on top like, like they did on their PC. It, it became very expensive and I think they didn't understand how important cost was to a consumer. Radio Shack is all over the country so 90% of the rural market was going to walk into a Radio Shack to buy their computer. E either that or they were going to buy it by mail with no support and people just were not computer savvy so that was not a good choice for them. So we, we had a built-in marketplace. Although Tandy Radio Shack were initially looking for a business PC. I'm convinced. Tandy Computers at Radio Shack Computer Centers. In business, for business. The reception to the Tandy 1000 showed that they had a home computer success on their hands. In 1988, CEO John Roach disagreed with then Apple CEO John Scully's rejection of the home market. He said, let him deny it. He's the only other person that's well represented in the home market. And if he wants to abandon it, it's all right with me. Tandy also regained a significant share of the Apple-dominated education market, which the two companies had once equally shared, with Tandy holding a 19% share of the K-12 grade market in 1986. One reason for the success of the Tandy 1000 is that it came bundled with DeskMate, its own operating environment built into the computer with basic functions like a calculator, text editor, file manager, spreadsheet, and more. So snazzy. It might not seem like much in today's standards, but it was still very early in the history of graphical user interfaces for the home computer market. Remember that the Mac had just hit the market and Windows 1.0 wouldn't be released until a whole year after the release of the Tandy 1000. Since the Tandy 1000 had the same sound and graphics capabilities as the IBM PC Jr., the companies that were making games at that time didn't have to change much to make them compatible with the 1000. Especially on the 1000s, I actually spent months in Silicon Valley going from software company to software company, training them on how to use Tandy 1000 computers, not to mention how to talk to joysticks and all the other hardware in, in, in that neighborhood. Most of what I wound up doing is making sure I had hardware that did what I wanted. So when we went out to the companies that were now establishing themselves as game companies for PCs would support us. And they were quick to do it because their option was a standard PC with CGA. So that really didn't help the products much. You know, one of the things that we could offer the outside product companies like Activision and Electronic Arts is a place on our shelf for their software. And when you got 7,000 stores, that's a big deal. A three voice sound generator and 16 color graphics was kind of the no brainer for all those companies. 
you know, Sierra, Ken, and I actually knew Ken back from when I was at Programma International. So having lived out in California, I knew, actually knew a lot of people. In fact, some of the most memorable games for the Tandy 1000 were from Sierra Online. Games like King's Quest, Space Quest, and the Black Cauldron were way more fun on the Tandy 1000 and future systems that supported what later became the Tandy standard because of the three sound voice chip and 16 color graphics that you couldn't get on an IBM PC at that time. Most likely you were stuck with four color CGA graphics. So I remember as a kid, right, going to Radio Shack and I would see top billing for Sierra titles. You guys had your own custom end caps. You had your games running on the computers um, and it was pretty exclusive. I mean, how did that how did that deal come about? Well, it was, um, I'll tell you, it's just a matter of being in the right place at the right time. It really happened because of the IBM PC Junior. And then they came to us one day and said, um, you know, this is top secret, but we're working on a new computer called the Peanut, they called it at the time, and uh, it became later the PC Junior. And so we put all that money in, we built these great games, and of course the PC Junior bombed. And within uh, almost immediately when the PC Junior bombed, I realized that uh, the Tandy 1000 that they were talking about had roughly the same uh, hardware as the PC Junior, but with an infinitely better keyboard. Yeah, and I actually met with um, several times with the uh, CEO of Radio Shack, uh, John Roach, and uh, he was excited to have some product that showed off his new machine. And uh, because Sierra had been um, under um, under the secrecy agreement with IBM, we quietly built all this software for the uh, what became the same specs as the Tandy 1000, or close enough. And uh, we were sitting there on day one when the Tandy 1000 came out with lots of good product and um, it worked for everybody. So we were able to migrate pretty much our whole product line to the uh, Tandy 1000 at a time when other people were just spinning up to speed. So, um, so yeah, I mean, Tandy, uh, Tandy and us uh, needed each other and we were there at the right time. And we suddenly had distribution in 6,000 outlets when um, our customers were kind of caught, I mean, our competitors were kind of caught flat-footed with uh, no product to sell. So it, it went beautiful. The Tandy 1000 developed over its lifespan into a dozen different models, depending on how you count them, adding faster processors, more memory, bigger hard drives, more modern I.O. interfaces, and improved deskmate software. I own two of these models, my trusty TL, which still runs great, and an older TX, which was recently found sitting in a three-inch puddle of water at eWaste, and I'll be attempting to repair that system in an upcoming episode, so make sure you're subscribed and have the notification bell on so you don't miss that one. In December 1986, Tandy released the first in a series of compact models with the Tandy 1000 EX. The EX and later the HX had fewer expansion slots but came at a cheaper price which made them very popular with consumers. If you want to know more details about all the various models of the Tandy 1000, I recommend you go check out the 8-Bit Guys Tandy 1000 video where he goes into much more detail than I'm going to be doing here, and I'll put a link to that video in the description below. Tandy Radio Shack would go on to release more capable computers like the 2500 and the 4000 lines, but the last model of the Tandy 1000 was the RSX, which had a 386SX processor, SVGA graphics, 1 megabyte of RAM, and an optional 52 megabyte hard drive. By 1993, shifts in the market made it harder for Tandy Corporation to sustain their profitability in the computer division, and as a result, Tandy sold its computer manufacturing operations to AST Computers, leading to the discontinuation of all Tandy computer lines. Following this, Radio Shack stores started offering computers from other manufacturers, including IBM, of all people, and Compaq. The popularity of the Tandy 1000 means that they aren't too difficult to find today, and I will always save them if I find them at eWaste. If you want to relive what it was like to own one of these classic PCs from 1984, you should be able to find one online without too much trouble. The Tandy 1000 from Tandy Radio Shack was a combination of the right people and the right product decisions and the right way to sell to consumers. For millions of people, this was their introduction into a new world of computing and created memories that will last a lifetime. 
I'd love to hear your memories of the Tandy 1000, so please leave them in the comments below. And if you want to watch or listen to my full interview with Mark, you can find it available on my Patreon page for free for everyone. Just click the link in the description below. Or to hear more about Mark's time working on the TRS-80 Color Computer, I'll link to his interview on the Coco Talk podcast. You can find that below as well. Thanks for watching, everybody, and we'll see you next time. So I, I saved the company a couple of hundred million dollars worth of Hercules boards. Wow. You should get a medal and, just and for, for that. And, and for that, the, the company gave me a pen. Are you serious? I'm serious. Oh, my goodness. Come on. Yeah, we made a big deal of the whole thing, and, and, and my reward was a pen. End of line.